My brothers and sisters in Christ, I'd like you to take your Bibles at this point, your devices, and would you travel with me to the book of Matthew. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're so thankful that God brought you to worship with us at Cross Point Community Church. Our prayer is that you are welcomed well when you come in and that you are fed well once you come into this church. So for the next 45, 50 minutes, working into an hour, <laughs> we are going to dig deeply into God's word. I want you to think of it this way. Of all the things you have going on this week, even the time you spend at night sitting down, turning on the next episode of your favorite television show, you're going to take hours during your week to do things that really don't mean a whole lot. I'm going to tell you, you're going to take the next hour of your week right now to do something that means a lot. It is jumping into God's holy word. And we get to do this together. If you're new with us today, we are in our series called Church Matters. Today is the day we will wrap up our study, a study we started in, believe it or not, July. Some interruptions through Christmas, but this was going to be a three-month study, ended up being a seven-month study. Uh, today, by God's grace, we will finish this up with this appropriate topic, Church Matters a certain future. Today there will not be as much explanation potentially and interpretation of passage as much as reading of God's word and seeing the story unfold. You will see there you have a handful of texts that we're going to go to. By God's grace we're going to turn to most of these if not all of them. I'm going to withhold talking a lot about each of these texts and what we're going to do is just like I mentioned, we're going to see God's plan for his church unfolded in these texts. When we started out this study, we jumped right into Hebrews chapter 10 verses 23 and 25. You're not there now, but listen to these words. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Today we are going to be thinking on that day that is drawing near. As we think on this day when Jesus will set this right, will return to claim his own, as we rejoice in these truths, my prayer is that we walk out of these doors encouraged finding resolve to live another day for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To live for the gospel. To embrace God's glory in every decision we make. Knowing that we have as God's church this certain future. We will be looking at this key truth today. As we consider the certain future of Jesus' church we must persevere with confidence. Out of the hundreds, I mean seriously, potentially thousands of texts in that Bible that you hold, I mean talking about the future of God's people. Today, guess what? We're going to start off with five of them. <laughs> we're going to overview and see what we're talking about what th with this certain future, starting with the text that's on your lap right now. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, to jump right into this, we're jumping right into a groundbreaking discussion with Jesus and his disciples. We've talked of this text often when we're talking about the church, but I want to just read this. Jesus with his disciples says this, verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, hey, who do 
people say that the Son of Man is? Verse 14. And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17, and Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Verse 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, shall not prevail against it. A lot of times we get held up on portions of this text. Necessary discussions like the one, who is this rock referring to? Or what is this rock referring to? So much that oftentimes we fail to recognize the weight behind the last phrase in this text. Where Jesus dogmatically says, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. The fact is, this is Jesus' church. He is building his church in his way, in his time, with his people. Further, because he is the one doing the building, the promise stands. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Hades is known as the abode of the dead. Many of you have studied this before. The abode of the dead. It can be taken in a more simplistic way to mean death. It's a euphemism for death. So what is Jesus saying here in Matthew chapter 16? I will build my church and death won't stop it. The point is this, even death will not stand in the way of Jesus' church. Death, the dagger of the Genesis fall. You remember the beginnings of your Bible. What did Jesus promise or what did God promise to Adam and Eve if they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Surely you will. Let's try that one more time. Surely you will die. From the beginning of our Bibles all the way through the Old Testament we find this death is highlighted. In fact, if you go to chapter 5 of Genesis, chapter 10, you see generation after generation, one thing that happened, death and now Jesus with his disciples in the beginning of the New Testament is telling them something. I'm going to build something. I'm going to put something together. It's going to be based on me, the cornerstone. And something will not mess with this. It is death. Because I will conquer this death. This is the truth Jesus' people have been holding on to for 21 centuries. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But practically, physical death does, not, does still happen <laughs> to believers. Have you thought about this? I mean, just thinking through how many of our own congregation in the last three years we've put to rest in the grave we've held ceremonies for. The fact of the matter is believers still go through physical death. How do we process this? Well, let's jump into the next text as we overview Jesus' plan for a certain future. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. Would you travel with me to 1 Corinthians known as the resurrection chapter? Getting me fired up for two weeks from now. Resurrection day. The resurrection chapter. Paul to the church of Corinth. Showing us what happens when Jesus' people experience physical death. 
those who have come to Jesus Christ in saving faith, given newness of life, given new life, what happens when they breathe their last breath? Paul shares us, uh, gives us a glimpse of this in 1 Corinthians 15. Would you look with me at verse 20? Again, just reading through these texts. Verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Okay, the term fallen asleep isn't saying they've got a long nap ahead of them. <laughs> All right, it's a euphemism for dead. They're dead. Verse 21, for as by a man came death, by a man has come the resurrection of the dead. Verse 22, for in Adam, he reaches back into the beginning of our Bibles, for as in Adam all dies, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Or if you want to say it this way, based on the situation here, uh, so also in Christ shall all be made alive shall all in Christ be made alive, if that helps you. But each in his own order. Christ is the first fruit, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. If you like highlighting things, would you highlight that? Those who belong to Christ. This is Jesus' church. Jesus' people. Because they belong to Jesus, Jesus' church will rise again. That's the truth of the scriptures. That living hope we just sung about is a reality, is a fact for every single believer. In fact, we see more of this in the end of this text. Would you look with me? Let's just go to verse 51. Because the church at Corinth is still trying to put this together in their minds. How is this working? It's like many believers. How is this going to work? Well, Paul shares this with us in verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. A quick comment on that. My favorite sign that I've ever seen in front of a nursery was that verse. <laughs> Completely taken out of context, but we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> That's not what he's talking about. Nonetheless, here we are. Verse 52. In a moment, here's the change. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed, church. For this perishable body must put on imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. Verse 54, when the perishable puts on imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written. One of my favorite phrases in all the Bible. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh death, where's your sting? Where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, what does the future of Jesus' church look like? Through the pain, the turmoil, the sting of death, we cling to this truth. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The story advances through our New Testament. More of clues we get. Would you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Paul to this church in Thessalonica is sharing with them more of what this will look like at the end. Several texts in 1 Thessalonians that we could go to. We want to dial in on 1 Thessalonians 4. In this text, the Apostle Paul further explains an event known commonly as the rapture of Jesus' church. Would you look with me at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13? 
Paul says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, those who are dead in Christ. That you may not grieve as others who, uh, as others do who have no hope. Verse 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's the gospel. Even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Verse 15. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Catch this, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet our Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with our Lord. Verse 18. Therefore, man, encourage each other with these words. What are we doing today, brothers and sisters in Christ? We're encouraging each other that there is a certain future for Jesus' church. Through the turmoil, the brokenness, the sin of the world we live in right now, we have hope. I want us to jump to the end of the story, Revelation chapter 19. As you're turning to Revelation 19, there's a wonderful metaphor that is brought into the picture by God's Spirit, by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, showing us how this is all going to function. The metaphor is a marriage. I'm sure you've heard this before. Contextually, culturally, in Jewish marriage, you would have essentially three stages, three parts to this thing, marriage. You would have a betrothal. This is an agreement. This is a, a giving of a dowry, a payment. And this betrothal would also include a portion of time where the groom would then go and prepare for the marriage ceremony. That was the first step, the betrothal and preparation. The second step you find in this marriage is the groom with his party would come and retrieve the bride. Other texts, including Christ's own teaching, we can see this. I'm going to refuse to go to all of that right now. The groom comes and retrieves the bride and takes her to the place of the ceremony. Then what happens? We have the marriage celebration, the feast. This is a ceremony like none other in that culture. This is a party like you've not seen. <laughs> this is awesome. Friends, that's, that's the unfolding of what we see in the end for Jesus' church. The metaphor given several times in the scripture is Jesus is the groom. The church is Jesus' bride. Jesus came and paid the payment for this relationship. He went away, as John 14 says, to do what? I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you will also be. These are the words of Jesus. Then what we find in the scripture, in the book of Revelation, the unfolding in 1 Thessalonians, the unfolding of Jesus Christ coming to retrieve his church. And then we find a celebration like no other celebration. It is known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. Where do we find that in our Bibles? Well, the text you're looking at right now. Revelation chapter 19. Would you look with me in this short text I would encourage you, if you want a blessing, read through chapter 19, 20, 21. Th read through all of this to the end this week. But Revelation 19, the Apostle John writes what he sees and hears in his vision of 
from the Spirit, from Jesus of the future. Verse 6, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Lord Almighty reigns. Verse 7. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Verse 8, it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of those made holy by Jesus, the saints. Verse 9, and the angel said to me, write this. (laughs) Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Friends, if you have come to Jesus Christ in saving faith, you are in Revelation chapter 19. You will experience the voice of a great multitude like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. You, my friend, will experience this by God's grace. This feast that will lead us into eternal glory with King Jesus and the new city, the new heavens and the new earth is further exposed in Revelation chapter 20. Some of you are like my wife. (laughs) We can't watch a series or on TV without her Googling what the end will be. You ever... We're watching a series together, we watch different episodes, and she has to Google what the end's gonna be, and I keep telling her, don't cheat! That's cheating! You can't do that! Yes, I can, I know. Friends, in this case, cheating is acceptable. We get to read the end of the story, Revelation chapter 21. And I just want to read this and expose what this beautiful, this certain future for the church, Jesus' people will look like. Verse 22, and I saw no temple in that city. Okay, this is the new Jerusalem come down from heaven. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. Verse 23, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the lamb. Verse 24. By its light will the nations walk. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. Verse 26. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. Friends, are you in Revelation chapter 21? If you've come to Jesus Christ in saving faith, guess what? You are. You're part of the nations, those from every kindred, tribe, people, and nation redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Verse 27, but nothing unclean will ever enter it. Nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Verse 20, or chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of who? The nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. 
But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign. How long? Forever and ever. Friends, what did we just see from God's holy word? There is a certain future for Jesus' church. We live in a broken world. We live in a sin-cursed world. We live with the temptations, the doubts, the uncertainty. We live with pain, with trial, tribulation. We live with physical death at some point. But in all of this, friends, we have the wonderful assurance from God's holy word that there is a certain future for Jesus' church. There is a certain future future that we hold on to with all we have. How do we know with certainty that these things will happen? The the immediate answer says because God's word says so. And we can hold on to that. The all sufficiency of the word of God. The sufficiency of, of God's every word. But in God's word, it gives us more reasons to believe this. And that's what we're going to take the remainder of our time to do today. Is show from God's word what this is based on. How can we be so certain of our future? How? Well, here's how. It's because the certainty of our future is not based on you or me. It's based on the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit speaks into the certain future of Jesus' church, the church. So I want us to spend some time this morning, again, just overviewing some of these texts. Let's look at three of them reminding us that the certainty of our future is based on the authoritative promises of Jesus Christ. Christ promised these things. Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of man, the Son of God, the eternal Lamb, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, he promises a certain future for his church. Where do we find that? Would you look with me at Matthew chapter 28? Maybe you're there. Again, lots of turning today. We've already talked of this text because this speaks into the mission of the church in our vision authentic discipleship but at the end of this great commission we find a wonderful promise that so often we neglect but this promise is something we hold on to until the end what am I talking about would you look with me at verse 18 of Matthew chapter 28 Jesus said Jesus came and said to them his disciples All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, here's the promise. I am with you. You always, to the end of the age, even when things get tough, we have the assurance that Jesus is present with us all the way to the end. The end that's mentioned here is actually the end of the age, leading us into the eternal age, the end of the beginning Let's go to John 11. What's happening in John 11? This is about a week before Jesus himself was on the cross. Remember the story of John 11? 
that through the death of his friend, a really good friend of Jesus, his name was Lazarus, Jesus gives us, gives us a wonderful promise. And I'm just going to read two of these verses. Jesus, in answer to Martha, he said, verse 25, Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never eternally die. <laughs> Do you believe this? This is the promise of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who conquered sin and rose from the death one week later. How else does Jesus share this promise? Would you travel with me to chapter 14 of John? Right there. We've already referenced this. Our certain future is based on the authoritative promise of Christ. Jesus now in the upper room with his disciples. John 13, he washes the disciples' feet, institutes what's known as the new covenant. Introduction to the Lord's Supper. Now in chapter 14, he's giving them some instructions. Verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. Your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, you can underline the next phrase. I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Verse 4, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas, the realist here, <laughs> said to him, Lord, we, we do not know where you are going. <laughs> How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How do we know, friends, at Cross Point Community Church, there's a certain end for Jesus' church because these authoritative promises shared in the New Testament are rooted in one person, Jesus, the one who rose from the dead and conquered death. This is all about Jesus. And Jesus tells us there is a certain end, a certain future for my people, my church. When we walk through scriptures, we find these authoritative promises of Christ. We also find that this certain future is based on the faithful care of a sovereign father. A lot of times we we fly past this particular point. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through six texts. And a lot of times I encourage you to turn or scroll to these texts. And, and certainly you can. These are longer texts. But I want to encourage you, even in the next five minutes as I read these texts, to sit back and just meditate. These texts were written to churches in the New Testament. Churches. How would they have interacted with these texts? Most likely someone would have come to them and read these texts to the congregation before they're passed on to the next church. Would you sit, my friends, and meditate on, this, on these texts for the next five minutes, reminding us of the faithful care of our sovereign God? What's gonna get us to the end? It's not what, it's who is going to get us to the end. It is your faithful, caring Father. Romans chapter 8, to the church of Rome. I'm going to read a longer text of scriptures. Would you soak in these texts? And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose... For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son 
in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Verse 30. And those Whom he predestined, he called. And those he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who indeed is interceding for us. Who, church, shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? (laughs) As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. So death doesn't derail this. Verse 37, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul shares that to the church of Rome. What does he say to the church of Corinth? So right now you are the church of Corinth. We've transitioned From Rome to Corinth. Would you listen to these words? Paul says this at the beginning of his letter. I give thanks to my God always for you. Because of the grace of God. That has been given. That was given you in Christ Jesus. That in every way church. You were enriched in him. In all speech and all knowledge. Even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. So that you are not lacking, church, in any gift. As you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8. Who will sustain you to the end? Church, mark that down. He will sustain you to the end. Guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9. This is not based on you. This is based on God. Here it is, verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, To the church of Rome, to the church of Corinth. What about to the church of Philippi? One verse I would like to read. You know this verse well because we quoted it often. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. And I am sure of this, Paul says, that he who began a good work in you will Bring it to completion at the day of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul, to the church of Thessalonica, says this. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Catch verse 24, church. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Not just Paul, but Peter. To dozens of churches being persecuted in the first century. What does Peter say in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 5? The passage that the song we just sang, Living Hope, is based on. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, church who by God's power are being guarded. Let's hold on to that. 
who by God's power, his faithfulness, his goodness, we are being kept through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last day. That's Peter. What about the half-brother of Jesus, Jude? Verses 24 and 25. Verse 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Friends, what's the story of the New Testament? God's got you. He's called you. He's redeemed you. He's guarding you all the way from the first day till the last day. He who has begun a good work in you will perform it to its completion in the day of Jesus Christ. All of these things we've talked about in regard to church matters, all of them mean something to God's church. But what is to keep us persevering to the end? It is, what is to keep us is the fact that Christ promises this and God, our heavenly father, he's got us. He's carrying us to the end. Now in all of this, we're reminded that very practically we struggle. We're reminded the realities of the world we live in. But this was not something that took God by surprise. The last thing I want to, the last concept I want us to focus on this morning is that the certainty of our future as Jesus' church is based on the continual strength of the indwelling Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit keeping us Till the last day, empowering us. I put there a text, John 14. I'm going to leave that for you to read on your own for sake of time this morning. But you understand what John 14 is talking about. Jesus says, I am going to send you a comforter. The paraclete, the one that's going to come alongside this helper, as some of our translations will say it. You're not in this alone. If you come to Jesus in saving faith, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. That's directly in this text, John 14, as promised by Jesus. I want us to see this, though, come alive a little bit more in the book of Ephesians. Would you travel with me to Ephesians chapter 1? Y'all are doing awesome turning to these texts. You didn't realize you're going to get worn out turning today. Your Sunday afternoon nap will be because you turned so many passages today. We find ourselves in Ephesians, though, reminding ourselves of the continual strength of the Holy Spirit given to us. I want us to look in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. What happens when we are justified? Verse 13, in, who, in him you also, so in Christ you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Okay, so when were you sealed with the Holy Spirit? When you were saved. Not saved and wait a long time and then sometime down the line you're going to be sealed. No. The story of this text is you cannot have salvation without being sealed with the Holy Spirit. Proven in the next verse. Verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory? Catch the wording of that. How long will this Holy Spirit be working in our lives, holding us, guiding us, guarding us, comforting us until we acquire possession of our inheritance? So when we come to Jesus Christ in saving faith, we are indwelt by the Comforter, the Holy Spirit of God. He is the guarantee of your relationship with God. He's got you. He will not leave you. 
Certainly there's times in our lives through poor choices we made of re- make of rebellion when that prompting, that, that work of the Holy Spirit through the word of God seems to be dimmed in our lives. The callousness of our own rebellion. But friend, if you come to Jesus Christ in saving faith, that Holy Spirit will never leave you. He will carry you to the end. Who is the one when you've fallen into rebellion that says, come back, come back, come back. Get into God's word. Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friend, it is the Holy Spirit of God. I think we find this very clearly in the last text. One of the last texts we'll go to today, Ephesians chapter 3. Flip over, please, to Ephesians chapter 3. The certainty of our future is based on the continual strength of this indwelling Holy Spirit. Ephesians 3, verse 14. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all saints, with all the church, what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that, pers- uh, that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. How does this happen? It's through the spirit that indwells you, believer. Verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. According to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. Forever and ever. Amen. Our certain future as a church, as Jesus' people, is based on the authoritative promises of Jesus. It's based on the faithful care of our loving God. It is based on the continual strength of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The Trinity. So what, church? How will this change us? I've gone through this whole study on church matters, dialing in on what this looks like, what this means, what our priorities should be, how this functions. All of it leading to the fact that there is a certain future for Jesus' church. All of it leading to what we just mentioned ago, that key truth. As we consider the certain future of Jesus' church, we must persevere with confidence. The last phrase of that key truth, the last phrase of the last key truth in this series is the so what. We must persevere with confidence. The question is this, knowing the certain future of Jesus' church, my friend, my brother and sister at Cross Point Community Church, will you, by God's grace, persevere with confidence? For those who have come to Christ in faith, saving faith, who love Jesus and his church, friend, by God's grace, this week, will you persevere? Will you endure? Tomorrow morning, when you get up, will you persevere by God's grace? Will you endure? Even through the pain, the turmoil, the trials, the death, will you persevere to the end? For those who have not come to Christ in saving faith, 
your future doesn't look so bright. The story of the Bible is you, my friend, will experience the condemnation of a holy God. But my friend, the story of the Bible is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But God commended his, demonstrated his love to us and while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. My friend, if you've never come to Jesus Christ in faith, would today be that day? Turn from your sin and trust in this Jesus. Embrace this certain future as exposed in God's holy word. I want to close out our study today with two Two writers, Paul and James. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says this. The end of the resurrection chapter that we read, most of it, or some of it. He says this. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. Be immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Cross Point Community Church, be steadfast. By God's grace, be immovable. By God's grace, always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing, Cross Point Community Church, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Then the other half-brother of Jesus, we've already read Jude, what does James say? James chapter 5, verse 8, you also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Cross Point Community Church, be patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is near. So God, we thank you for your holy word. Oh God, everything we talked about today is by your grace. The hope that we have, the promise of a certain future for your church God, especially what we talked about at the end, that this is all by your grace causing us to persevere to the end, endure to the end. Oh God, I pray. I pray for Cross Point Community Church. This little C church that's part of your big C church. This community of people called out from every kindred and tribe and people and nations, redeemed by the blood of your Lamb, who will one day gather to praise the Lamb for all eternity. But God, I pray for this outpost in your kingdom. This church, give us grace, I pray, Almighty Father, to persevere to the end. To trust the one who keeps us trusting. We love you, Father. My friends here today, we'll close out in a couple of short moments of prayer. The meditation of our study this morning is that there is a certain future for Jesus' church. But the call of the study today is that you would persevere by God's grace. You would endure one day at a time, resting, trusting, hoping. Would you pray that God would give you the grace to trust the one who keeps you trusting? I mention that phrase because that phrase has
God has used that phrase in my life in a massive way. The last two months I've been reading a book I've shared with many of you, Dark Clouds and Deep Mercies. How to present lament to a sovereign God. In the brokenness of the world we live in, the pain and the suffering. This man that God used to write this book to encourage his church. Used the words of another faithful servant of Jesus who reminded him that we are simply trusting the one who keeps us trusting. To our Father, we come to you, we're thankful. Thankful for redemption. Thank you for a relationship that we have with you through Jesus Christ. This relationship that you're growing in us. You're developing in us. This relationship with a certain end, a certain future. Oh God, I pray that you would give us grace at Cross Point Community Church to trust the one who keeps us trusting. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, thank you for your listening ear this morning. I pray that what we talked about today will be taken out into our community this week. Would you stand as we close with a verse of benediction. As you're standing, there's some of you came ready to share of your resources today. Uh, There's boxes in the back. You can worship through sharing in that way or certainly online, you can do that as well. Let us enjoy fellowship. Those who will participate in the potluck hosted by the Sunshiner Group this morning. Our verse for the day, one we just read a minute ago. Found in Jude. This half-brother of Jesus Christ who didn't put his faith in Jesus until after the resurrection. He says this, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, To him be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, let let that truth drive us to walk in newness of life this week.